We all know our modern world runs on oil, but it used to run on coal. So, at what point did oil take over? The history of oil is often portrayed as humanity discovering a superior fuel, then using it. Oil takes over, coal is no longer in vogue, the end. And maybe when we achieve net positive fusion in the next decade or so, the same story will play out again, absolving us from our hydrocarbon chains. But energy system transitions are not so simple. Just to put into perspective how much of an oversimplification this actually is, coal was in use as a primary power source since roughly the mid-1700s, and the first oil well was tapped in 1859. But it wasn't until 1955 that hydrocarbon power plants surpassed coal power plants for energy generation. That's 96 years it took oil to replace coal. But when oil finally did take over, it did so relatively quickly. Abrupt even. U.S. coal-fired power plants went from 62% in 1940 down to 23% by 1970, while those of hydrocarbons increased from 26% to almost 70% in the same time frame. In other words, over the 96 years between oil's first use and its eventual takeover, it just kind of sat there for 66 years playing second fiddle. Why? Well, you see, some stuff had to happen first. Oil entered a world where everything was designed to use coal. Oil using things had to be invented, iterated on, perfected, and mass produced. Oil technology diffused. And one oil using thing in particular is what caused the final breaking point for the oil transition to happen. The development, or rather maturation, of internal combustion engines. And it was World War I that pushed the development of, or rather, that matured the internal combustion engine as soldiers rode into World War I on horseback and rode out on tanks and planes. World War I was won with, well, of all things, well-oiled machines. And World War II was too. When the World Wars were won, the internal combustion engine had not only been perfected, technically, but also had massive manufacturing infrastructure behind it, due to the massive market demand created by the destruction of two world orders. Since higher octane gasoline derived from oil was the only suitable fuel for internal combustion, this drove market demand for refined petroleum products. This increase in demand widened the petroleum supply market, giving rise to larger oil tankers and pipeline infrastructure, accelerating the spread of petroleum at a global scale and at declining prices. Eventually, a breaking point was reached and all new power plants were commissioned to run on oil-derived products using internal combustion engines. So it was the world wars that led to the widespread adoption of the internal combustion engine that won oil the throne, not oil's merit alone. Note that Franz Ferdinand was assassinated largely because the engine of the early automobile he was riding in stalled thus kicking off World War I, which led to World War II, which demanded higher performing engines, which drove engine development and mass production, which increased demand for gasoline, which increased demand for oil, which drove investment into oil and made it cheaper, which led to the global vehicle industry, drive-throughs, superhighways, urban sprawl, and emissions. Fate sure loves irony, but hey, at least our cars don't stall when trying to reverse out of assassination alleyways. Even though, well, auto accidents are the fourth leading cause of death in the US. Uh, anyway, another development was happening at the same time that oil was taking over from coal. The development of nuclear power, which by the 1960s achieved the status of a technically proven and commercially viable energy source. By the middle of the decade, electric power utilities were placing their orders for nuclear plants on a routine basis. The trend of expanding the use of nuclear power continued further during the 1970s. Additionally, the oil price shocks of the 1970s gave a big boost to the promotion and further development of nuclear power. So by 1980, there were 253 operating nuclear power plants in 22 countries with 230 more units under construction. Everything seemed grand. The future was bright and clean. From nuclear energy, clean to make, clean to use, cleans the total environment. But as nuclear power became more common, its scientific glamour diminished. And as it was transformed during the 1970s into a hard industrial reality, 
the public became increasingly aware, interested, and concerned. Association with the bomb, destruction, danger, invisible radiation, secrecy, and the fear of the unknown added to the disfavor towards nuclear power. Environmental concerns had increased sharply, especially in the highly industrialized countries, and environmentalist organizations blossomed and quickly turned their attention to nuclear power not at all influenced by big oil money or Soviet disinformation campaigns. Also, the media, which, yeah, I mean, you know the media. Gradually, public acceptance became a major issue for the promoters of nuclear power, as anti-nuclear lobbies cropped up everywhere. Then, in 1979, the first major accident in any nuclear power plant occurred, at the Three Mile Island plant in the United States. This shook up the nuclear industry worldwide, and though installed nuclear capacity kept increasing as plants went into operation, new construction starts became fewer and fewer as many projects on order or even under construction were suspended and cancelled. As if that wasn't enough, nuclear power was dealt a final blow in 1986 as the world's worst known nuclear power plant disaster occurred at Chernobyl. This was the final nail in the coffin as it proved to the public their fears were not particularly irrational. And so, concerned with safety, we kept burning fossil fuels for 30 years, hoping solar and wind would save us, one day. Except for France and Illinois and a few other places, nuclear power was all but abandoned. So let me put that into perspective. Coal was used since the mid-1700s, let's just say 1755, and rained for 200 years until oil toppled it in 1955, which was then quickly being replaced by nuclear within only 20 years of its takeover. Think about that. In an alternate reality, oil would have just been a footnote, that transitional stuff we used for about 30 years. Okay, maybe that's a bit exaggerated as oil still would have had a huge market for vehicles. You know, all those combustion engine using things. Not to mention all the stuff we make out of oil. But as for energy generation, oil and natural gas would have had a short reign. But at last it's still king in 2023. But what if nuclear power could be made so safe, so ridiculously robust that nobody operating in good faith could deny it? Well, then the problem would be proving it to the public, educating the masses to relight the torch of a clean nuclear future. Well, as it turns out, trisul fuel, or tristructural isotropic particle fuel, but we say trisul fuel for short, is likely the development that nuclear desperately needed to have both the economic viability to replace hydrocarbon power plants and the safety to convince the public. It has a negative temperature reactivity coefficient, which means if it gets too hot, it stops fissioning and cools down. Each triso particle is made up of a uranium carbon and oxygen fuel kernel. The kernel is encapsulated by three layers of carbon and ceramic based materials that prevent the release of radioactive fission products. This triple coated layer structure, or tri structural design, allows the pellets to retain fission under all reactor conditions as they are structurally more resistant to neutron irradiation, corrosion, oxidation, and high temperatures than traditional reactor fuels, giving them a ton of flexibility. Simply put, triso particles cannot melt in a commercial high temperature reactor and can withstand extreme temperatures that are well beyond the threshold of current nuclear fuels. But perhaps most importantly, the layered structure essentially acts as both a containment building and also the nuclear waste disposal container when the fuel is all used up. Finally, the pebble bed design allows operators to just drop these fuel pellets into the top where they will react for a long time, get completely used up, and then just fall out the bottom. This means you can fuel it continuously. You don't have to shut it down for a month and change out the fuel rods like in traditional reactors. So what does this mean? Well, it means our reactors can, one, be safer, while, two, operating at higher temperatures, which means they can, three, be made smaller, which means, four, they can be made in a factory according to a standardized design, which will, five, give nuclear energy the potential to have much needed economies of scale, which will, six, reduce costs, just like what happened with oil. Safer, dynamic, more effective, smaller, cheaper. This technology is not some super exciting physics breakthrough like fusion. It uses good old tried and true fission, 
We've worked with Fission for 80 years, and that's precisely why this has the potential to revolutionize our world, for it is the coming together, the, ironically, the fusion of mature technologies rigorously designed, tested, and iterated on over the course of decades. The accumulation of the products derived from the entire life's work of multiple generations. Exciting new breakthroughs are rarely financially and economically viable, and when they are, it typically takes years to bring to market. Longer when they possess the ability to overhaul the entire system by which our world works. The first commercially viable oil well was drilled in 1859, but Old King Coal was not toppled overnight. Rather, coal remained the primary source of power until around 1955. The first oil wells were, well, crude. Technology had to mature and scale and integrate and diffuse. Oil took 96 years to replace coal as the dominant energy resource globally. And considering fission was achieved just 80 years ago, I'd say we're actually right on track. 